Great. Hi, guys. Um, I'm talking about decentralized mining pools for Bitcoin. Uh, this talk is really kind of a call to action. I think a lot of people believe uh, there is a, a very serious um, threat in the decentralization of Bitcoin and most of the cryptocurrencies, for that matter, revolving around uh, mining pools. Um, and so I think uh, I'm going to show you a number. I'm going to show you the why. I'm going to show you some of the how. And uh, I think we need to build this. And uh, hopefully people will be interested enough uh, to join me in this. So why build a decentralized mining pool? Um, large pools are probably the, the biggest threat to decentralization, right? Uh, there are very few parties you have to contact and co-opt. If governments wanted to shut down Bitcoin, they only have to contact three, maybe four of the largest pools. Uh, and they could completely censor transactions. They could uh, do all kinds of, of mayhem. Um, Pools can censor transactions, right? If uh, the governments went to them and said, please censor these, these addresses or these UTXOs, they could. Uh, a big part of the solution to this is Matt Corallo's work, who will be following me and uh, speaking after me on uh, his work on BetterHash. Pools can also refuse payout or cheat. They hold large wallets, um, and they're responsible for paying you for your shares. They do accounting for those shares, and they could, in principle, do that accounting improperly. Um, and your recourse in the event of any of the above is poor, unless you live in a jurisdiction, same jurisdiction as your pool, and you have a legal contract with them. I don't think very many people have a legal contract besides the terms and conditions on some website about the pool that they're using. Um, so any proposed decentralized pool has to be markedly better than the centralized pools we're using now. How can we do that? Um, so today, the, the, a new idea I'm going to throw out there in this talk is the idea that we create a, a new coin for shares, for mining shares. And I'll justify why that makes sense. This can become the basis for derivative instruments, which allows miners to hedge their, uh, their risk with respect to purchasing mining hardware and running mining hardware. Second element is uh, using a directed acyclic graph. Um, this is some work uh, I've been doing for a couple years. There are two other talks out there that I've given on uh, directed acyclic graph-based blockchains. If you Google the phrase breeding the blockchain, you'll find um, two talks by me that go into more detail. I don't have enough time here today to go into great detail, but t talk to me afterwards. I can give you lots of, lots of details. Another element is the use of relay networks. Um, the orphan rate on, on Bitcoin is way down in the last couple of years compared to previously, and a large part of that, I believe, is due to the relay networks. Um, Payment channel-based payouts, we've had an explosion in the, the Lightning Network. We've had an explosion in um, uh, non-custodial trading, uh, which is also using payment channels. Uh, we could be using payment channels to pay hashers instead of making large coin bases, as, uh, as some pools do. Uh, finally, uh, BetterHash is out there. It is uh, very good for low latency communication with uh, your mining hardware, your hashing equipment, as well as running your own node and constructing your own blocks. They're, thereby evading uh, the censorship problem of pools. So first of all, let's, let's take a look at the, uh, the state of mining pools. On the left, we have Bitcoin. And you, know, you can see, OK, so who do I have to co-opt here if I want to censor transactions on Bitcoin? I've got two, uh, two pools in China, a couple of others maybe, and that would be enough. right? And any government agency who wants to contact only four companies, this is not really a big deal uh, for them. Um, if we look at Ethereum on the right-hand side, there's something I want to call attention to here, and that is that if you look in the, um, uh, the top left of the graph for Ethereum, you notice that there are a lot more smaller pools on Ethereum. Why is that? Um, I think this lar the large pools on the right here are more, mostly a social phenomenon, and you don't actually need those large pools from a, a profit or hedging perspective. If you take a look at Bitcoin and you ask, all right, I want to make sure my profits are within 1% of some target. I've bought a bunch of equipment. I know it's going to compute this many hashes. I'm going to assume the hash rate uh, is constant or something like that. I'm going to assume the price of Bitcoin. And I want to make sure I hit my, my target within 1%. That means you have to have a pool that is at least 19% of the Bitcoin network. And this is simply Poisson statistics based upon how many blocks per year get mined. Um, and uh, if you do the same calculation for Ethereum, you need to have a pool that is 0.47 of the network. So the reason for this is simply that Ethereum has faster blocks. There are more blocks in a year, and uh, any given pool will have more blocks, and therefore less error on the amount of blocks they receive, and therefore error on their profits. So one of the things that we have to do if we want to create a decentralized mining pool is decrease the block time, increase the block rate. So what, what do mining pools do in the first place, and why would people use them? Um, the reason pools exist is because they decrease your variance. If I'm a miner, and let's say I have enough mining equipment to mine one block per month, 
which is, a, which is an investment in mining hardware of around a million dollars. This is a, you know, a small mining operation these days. Um, that, one, that one block per month, uh, the error on Poisson statistics is the square root, right? So this means, um, the numbers I have on the top of my head are 10 blocks per year instead of 12, but the, the error on that is about three. So I might win seven blocks in a year, I might win 13, right? If I'm seven, that's, that's way down from my expected target. Uh, and if I have to pay power bills, uh, I may not be able to pay them because I just simply didn't get enough. And this is simply luck. It's simply luck. There's nothing I can do to fix that. And what people do is they join these pools. The pool itself wins more blocks um, and thereby decreases the variance in your payout. Um, this 1% annual profit variation corresponds to a 3.5% monthly profit variation. And so if you're a miner, you have to be able, and you're using one of these 19% pools, uh, you have to be able to handle a monthly variation of, of downwards by 3.5% in any given month. Um, that means there's a 68% chance, one standard deviation, that your monthly profits are within 3.5% percent to your naive target. So within one year, if you're a miner who can approximately win one block per month, uh, I will have roughly two months where I'm below in my, in my earnings by 3.5%. Uh, That's using a 19% pool. So this is why people use pools in the first place, is to reduce this, this variation. Um, the only way, real way to, to affect this is to increase the sampling rate and thereby uh, decrease the block time. So historically, there is a decentralized mining pool out there. Uh, it's called P2 Pool. Um, it was a decentralized mining pool. It is now mostly defunct. Uh, it is a blockchain. It is a merged mined blockchain. Uh, any block on the P2 block, Pool blockchain can be a Bitcoin block. It has a lower target difficulty by about a factor of 20 compared to Bitcoin, which means it has 20 times more blocks or a block time of about 30 seconds. The consequence of decreasing the block time in, in a blockchain is you get more orphans. There's a higher probability that two people on opposite sides of the earth accidentally mine a block at approximately the same time. And one of them wins the race and is able to get the, the block to the other miners more quickly. And the people mine on top of it and extend the longest chain. Um, because of this drastically increased orphan rate, um, the, your payout on P2 pool, uh, they actually kept track of the orphans. And your payout was relative to your, um, your relative, what they called stale rate or dead on arrival. This is one of the problems with P2 pool. It was a bit of a marketing problem to call your shares dead on arrival. <laughs> so when you go on your status page and you see dead on arrival in your, in your payouts, you know, a lot of people look at that and say, what the heck am I doing on this pool? Maybe I should go to one that doesn't tell me I'm dead. <laughs> um, so this, uh, what this means is that you could optimize your payout by optimizing your latency with respect to other nodes in the P2 pool network. And I've heard informally from people who are actually doing this that they could achieve 140% increase in profit by optimizing which peers they connected to on the P2 pool network. So this is bad, right? This is uh, not fair by any means, right? This is worse than, uh, than centralized pools. So the way you get faster is you have to decrease the block time, right? And if I decrease it far enough, I get more orphans than I get blocks. And the, I'm, I'm no longer able to uh, move this state forward. Um, the solution to this, the fastest you can get here, is to move from a block chain to a directed acyclic graph. A directed acyclic graph has the property that any given block can name more than one parent, right? Uh, this allows you to get down to the, the fastest you could possibly run this. And based on some analysis I did a couple years ago, uh, back before the relay networks came online, we could get down to a block time of around six seconds with this structure. With the relay networks, I, could believe, I believe we could get down to a block time of around half a second. So this is a factor of 1,000 faster than Bitcoin, which means 1,000 times smaller pools, 1,000 times faster block rate, and a substantial decrease uh, in, your, in your variance for your payout. So the new idea I really want to talk about in this talk is um, using shares as a derivative instrument. So when you mine on a centralized pool, uh, you have a share, right? And the share is just held in a database by the pool operator, and they promise to pay you uh, proportional to your shares, and they do all the accounting for you, and you hope that they do it correctly. The distributed mining pool, um, decentralized mining pool, does all this accounting via consensus rules of the blockchain. So everybody can verify that they're getting, getting paid correctly. Now, there are two things that miners need in order to uh, ensure their profits. Um, 
as financial markets evolve, they start to develop more sophisticated financial instruments for, uh, for various things. And if you're a producer, this is really a producer-consumer environment. This is very similar to if you're extracting oil or you're growing corn. And there are financial instruments created for those, uh, those commodities markets to allow you to hedge your uh, uncertainties in your production. So the uncertainty in your production, fundamentally, in Bitcoin is the hash rate. I don't know what the hash rate is going to be tomorrow or next month or next year. And my profit is a function of that. So if I had a financial instrument where I could buy a contract that would pay me if the hash rate is larger than I expect, or I would pay them if it's lower than I expect and I earned more than I expected, this would enable me to uh, smooth out my profits and in essentially ensure that I am profitable. This is the function of derivative markets. It's a function of futures and options markets for commodities. So the way we have to do this on uh, a blockchain is we have to uh, make the shares a coin. The fundamental commodity in, a, in uh, Bitcoin is the hash rate. It is not Bitcoin, it's the hash rate. We convert that hash rate into Bitcoin via the, uh, the emission schedule, via the halving and the number of Bitcoins that are produced in the Coinbase. Um, so let's imagine that this was actually its own coin. So the picture is there is a blockchain. Some of the blocks in this direct acyclic graph-based blockchain are Bitcoin blocks. And each of the coin bases of that blockchain allocate a number of terahash coins proportional to the, the difficulty. So I, as a miner, I'm going to collect these terahash coins. And then it's up to me to decide what to do with them. I, I want to exchange them for Bitcoin because the terahash coins are not worthwhile by themselves. They are simply an instrument. Um, what we're really doing here is, is creating a derivative market. Right? A derivative is dy dx. Right? There are two variables there. There's y and there's x. So I have to have two instruments in order to create a derivative. So the two instruments here are the hash rate coin and Bitcoin. I'm creating D Bitcoin, D hash rate, right? And with that, I can create a futures instrument or an options instrument that would allow me to hedge my, hedge my exposure to the hash rate. So the first instrument we, we need to hedge against is how many blocks do I win or my pool win? And this is simply luck, right? And it's a function of the hash rate, the other people that are mining out there. Second thing I need to hedge is the price of Bitcoin, right? There are already futures instruments out there for that. The CME has a number of markets now uh, for futures on the, um, the fiat value of, of Bitcoin. But I still don't know how many Bitcoins I'm going to get. So I need to hedge both in order to have a profitable mining operation. Um, so just as an example, uh, just, just for some mental uh, model, um, 36 million terahashes is approximately one S9 month at 14 terahashes per second for an S9. Um, Picture that the, this merged mine blockchain consumes terahash coins and produces bitcoins. So I can create a transaction which sends my terahash coins and says, please exchange these for bitcoin at the next available Coinbase opportunity. That Coinbase will then destroy the terahash coins and produce the bitcoin. Fundamentally, this is what we're doing anyway, right? The miners are creating hashes. They're computing a certain number of SHA-256 decalculations, and out of that comes bitcoin. Now, all we're really doing is adding an accounting layer for the number of SHA-26D calculations performed. And we're just in enforcing this rule that we're going to swap those for, for Bitcoin. Um, the interesting thing about having this as a coin is now there's many ways to do this. I can create a market in which I create a contract that says I promise to deliver a certain number of terahash coins and you promise to deliver me Bitcoin. This is a futures instrument. Uh, so why a terahash coin? Um, in traditional futures markets, the produced good is delivered at the end of the futures contract. Uh, if I'm a corn grower, at the end of the day, a truck shows up somewhere with a bunch of corn on it, right? What is the produced good if I'm talking about mining? The produced good is a certain number of, of uh, SHA-256 decalculations. So I need to produce that number of SHA-256 decalculations in such a way that those hashes that were calculated could have been Bitcoin blocks. Maybe some of them even were. But I need to prove that I have done that number of SHA-256 decalculations. Um, a SHA-256 decalculation in isolation is useless. If I just plug in my S9 and don't connect it to a pool, um, it's wasting energy, right? Th those hashes are not useless, or are, are, are useless. So what I need is that the hashes that were computed could have been Bitcoin blocks, but they had too low of a target difficulty. But the target difficulty in the share chain is proof that I did a certain number of calculations. Um, so arbitraging this hash rate variance requires the ability to deliver those unlucky hashes to someone who, who is perhaps someone other than the pool operator. 
right? I want to deliver those hashes to an arbitrager. There are professional arbitraging firms who uh, all they do is they look at production of oil, of corn, lots of other things. They market make futures markets and options markets. Uh, and they perform the service of absorbing risk for the producers of those goods. Um, I have heard informally from a number of very large prop shops who do this kind of trading that they are very interested in trading and, and absorbing this kind of risk, modeling this kind of risk. Um, if you're a miner and you have to model all this risk, in addition to actually running a profitable mining operation, that's a lot of burden on you. There are professional firms out there who do it and will sell you a contract, if they could. So a couple of examples. A forward contract. Forward contract is a private agreement to buy the TerraHash share coins for Bitcoin at a fixed rate at a fixed time. So one month from now, I'm going to give you my collected share TerraHash coins, and I know exactly how many I'm going to have, right? Because I have a S9, it computes 14 TerraHashes per second. I'm going to plug it in for a month. This corresponds to about 36 exahashes. Um, this is 14 TerraHashes a second times the number of seconds in a month. Uh, and at today's price, uh, this is about 0 0.013 Bitcoin. So I'm going to create a contract where I'm going to deliver you these exahash coins, these TerraHash coins, and you're going to give me that Bitcoin a month from now. Um, forward contracts must be settled. This is, these are usually private contracts. Um, and markets have de developed around futures contracts, which are standardized, uh, standardized types of contracts which are rebalanced every day. Another option for uh, arbitraging your risk is a call option. And this is the option, but not the obligation, to buy these TerraHash coins for Bitcoin at a fixed price at some time in the future. So in other words, uh, if I earned more money than I expected, I'm not required to settle this, right? I would, this is called being out of the money, and I'm not required to settle this contract. But if I'm, uh, but if I'm in the money, I can call this option and, and require the, the counterparty to deliver the Bitcoin to me. Um, for some comparisons, there are weather futures on the CME. Um, if you are a producer of oil and it's too warm in the winter and nobody's using oil to heat their homes, uh, people arbitrage their exposure to the weather uh, via these kind of weather contracts. Um, all right, only 15 minute talk. If you want to talk more, please come find me afterwards. Conclusions, I think we need to reboot P2 pool. I think we need to rebuild a decentralized mining pool. This would solve the, uh, the centralization problem we have around pools today. Uh, this might consist of a TerraHash coin. This would enable us to build decentralized, uh, not even decentralized, decentralized markets for, that would enable us to arbitrage risk. Uh, we need better hash, which hopefully Matt will say a few words about after this, um, which uh, allows everybody to build their own blocks and uh, is a stratum replacement, a new wire protocol. There's many great things in there. A directly cyclic graph slash braid, uh, which lets us run the thing faster. And this, this number of 1,000 running about 1,000 times faster is about as fast as you can get. If we want to go faster than that, we have to go to some other completely different kind of technology. Finally, um, with all the work that's been going on in payment channels, we could be doing these, these payouts via payment channels too. One of the really unfortunate things about P2Pool is it put everybody's payout in the Coinbase. And so you have these giant coin bases with thousands of people being paid, which is competing in block size against the fees you might have earned. Um, if we use payment channels for that, we can remove all of that on-chain data and instead have your coin base be a channel opening through which all the other hashers get paid. So uh, there's an IRC channel for this, Braid Pool. Um, there's a number of other ideas discussed besides what I've been mentioning here. Uh, please come join me to build this.